Oh, hello there. So, I've been thinking that most of my regular videos tend to be a little on the lengthy side. You know, long-winded retellings of certain games, and, you know, while I really do enjoy doing that, I thought it'd be a fun change of pace to do the exact opposite. So in this case, retell an entire series of games with as little detail as possible. And, well, with a brand new title currently making waves right now, what better place to start than with the Fire Emblem series? So, what I'll try to do is cover the broad strokes of each game from start to finish and get across what each one entailed. So, you know, spoilers, I guess. You know, really broad ones. Oh, and for a little bit of fun, I figured I'd just end every game with a sheet that points out a few of my personal opinions on each game. You know, little things like the soundtrack or the gameplay, and I mean, what Fire Emblem list would be complete without a little discussion about the best boys and girls populating this massive dating simulator? I mean, TRPG. So, without further ado, uh, here they are. This one opens, as 90% of these games do, with a large evil empire invading a smaller peace-loving one. This time, it's the nation of Deluna, or Dor, depending on your version, that's invading the nation of Arcanea, or Arcania, again, depending on your version. Of course, this just so happens to be the home of our main boy, Marth, who gets to watch as his dad is killed, their family sword is stolen, and his sister is captured while he flees to another nation called Talos. A few years pass by. Marth grows from an effeminate boy into an effeminate teenager, and a quest is embarked upon to rescue his sword, his sister, and his homeland. Along the way, he obtains the mystical titular Fire Emblem, an artifact so rare and powerful that it can open chests without a key. So, it's a ancient mystical lockpick. After that, he kicks some ass, saves his sister, gets the master so I mean, the falchion, and defeats the dark and evil dragon ruling the Delunian Empire. Having completed his quest, he returns home to rebuild his empire, and as a reward, he gets one of the few canon romances that the series offers. This game is a much more romantic affair, following the path of two childhood friends, Alm and Selica. Alm is a totally normal village boy, there's absolutely nothing special about him. I mean, sure, he has no idea who his parents were, and I mean, yeah, his old man mentor figure is always acting weird and mysterious. And yes, he's had this mystical mark on his hand since birth and he doesn't know what it means, but I mean, come on, he's just a regular kid. Selica, on the other hand, is a princess from a kingdom named Sophia. She was forced into hiding after her home was ransacked in a coup, and had to assume a fake alias, Selica, as her real name is Antiques. Anyway, she's brought to Alm's village, where the two enjoy the most idyllic, saccharine childhood one could possibly imagine. Until, of course, the forces of evil searching for Selica track her down, and she's forced to leave her idyllic life and her childhood crush. Anyways, our journey actually begins a few years later, after they've been separated and grown up a little. We get to watch Alm as he joins the resistance to rise up against the tyrannical Emperor Rudolf, who took over the kingdom of Regel. He rises up through the ranks, inspires the hearts of thousands, and eventually defeats the Emperor. There he finds out that he's the son of the Emperor, and that this entire game has been some elaborate plot by the Emperor to, uh, fulfill an ancient prophecy. Hmm. Anyways, now he's the Emperor of Regel, and he makes to meet up with Selica. Selica's story instead follows her finding out the dark, mystical secrets behind the war Alm is fighting. While doing this, she assumes the crown of Sophia, receives some aid from that mysterious Racer X. Unknown to speed, this is his older brother Rex, who ran away from home years ago, and is now known as Racer X. And attempts to revive an ancient god, before getting captured by an evil sage working for a, uh, different ancient god. In any case, the two eventually meet up, they have a small lover's quarrel. <laughs> But fortunately, Selica survives, thanks to something, something magic. Their powers finally united, they work together to defeat one of the ancient gods so that the land can be free from them. After that, they get married, the nations unite, and the world is happy. This game is more like an expansion pack than an actual installment. Basically, it's a sequel to the first game, but it also contains the first game. So there's not really a lot to tell. So it turns out a former ally of Marth was actually evil. So Marth must once again set out on a quest to assemble a mishmash of funky hairdos in order to save the world. Only for Marth to find out that the evil dragon from the first game was actually controlling the evil guy from this game. And so ultimately, Marth defeats the evil dragon again and saves the world. 
again. This is the complicated one. There's a lot of feuding empires and talk of royal bloodlines, so bear with me here. Basically, long, long ago, 12 dudes had to go and defeat an evil dragon, and this game is based around the lineage of those 12 dudes. In the current timeline, the story follows our main man and total hottie, Sigurd. He's forced to defend his homeland against an invading evil nation, while his father and the prince of the nation are off fighting barbarians. Anyway, he begins a long campaign to defend his nation, wherein he rescues a princess, meets the love of his life, Deidre, and even as a kid. Everything's going great until, wouldn't you know it, a group of dukes and other noblemen murder the prince and pin the blame on Sigurd, who's forced into exile. Meanwhile, Deidre is captured by an evil sage, has her memory completely erased, and then the sage sets her up with her... half-brother. Because they'll have the perfect... children. Huh. In any case, while that's going on, Sigurd fights back against the people who framed him, kills the evil standing in his way, and heads back to the castle. Only to find, Arvis has taken over the throne and is happily married to Deidre, before Arvis promptly has Sigurd executed. because remember, Sigurd had a son named Selef. While the whole commotion with Sigurd getting exiled had been going on, Selef had been hidden away, and now the story focuses on him, as well as the other kids you turned out over the course of the game. Really, it's a game about eugenics. Anyways, 15 years have passed, Avaris's kingdom has grown into a full-blown empire, and he had a pair of twins named Julia and Julius. Only to have his son Julius usurp him as supreme leader. Oh, and of course, it's all actually a plot, secretly being manipulated by the evil archmage that erased Deidre's memories. Yeah. It's Fire Emblem. Anyways, that's when our boy Selif shows up, now finally old enough to begin his quest to reclaim the throne and right the wrongs done to him and his family. He sets out, recovers all the kids he spent so long making, kills his stepfather Avarice, teams up with his half-sister Julia, and eventually defeats his other half-sibling Julius and assumes his rightful position as king. This game actually takes place in the middle of the last game, after Sigurd's death and before Selof began his quest to retake the throne, but honestly, not a whole lot happens. We follow our main boy, Leif, a disposed prince who spent most of his time in hiding, who's just been found out by his enemy, who managed to capture two of Leif's friends. Leif decides that now is the time to fight back against the evil plaguing his home. He forms a ragtag resistance that slowly grows over the course of the game, eventually gets aid from Selif, who's now started his way on his own journey, defeats the man who usurped his throne only to have him turn into an undead zombie, thanks to, you guessed it, an evil sage who's working behind the scenes. So he goes off, defeats the evil sage as well as all of his minions, regains his throne, and joins Selif to finish off the events of FE4. This story follows our boy, Roy, the son of a Marquess of the region of Foray in the nation of Lycia. His dad, Elliewood, is sick, so he's forced to take up the mantle of leadership. Because blood is thicker than military experience? I don't know. Seriously, Roy's like 15, why not just give it to Marcus for the time being? Anyways, he heads off to defend against the invading forces of the large evil nation known as Burn, only to watch as another leader of Lycia, Hector, gets taken out like a bitch. What the fuck, Hector? I've seen you shrug off entire armies with nary a scratch, and that's how you go down? Ugh. Anyways, he ends up meeting up with the Princess of Bern, a girl named Guinevere, who opposes the war that her brother Zephiel has been spreading. So together, the two travel to find a way to put a stop to Bern by assembling a mismatched group of individuals, discovering the eight sacred weapons of old, and eventually finding the ultimate weapon, the Binding Blade. A weapon so stupidly powerful that it actually makes Roy a useful unit. So anyway, Roy marches his way into Burn, discovers Zephiel's master plan to awaken the evil dragons so that he can, uh, give the land back to them? Hmm. After defeating him, he finds out that he was actually keeping a secret pet dragon that was turning out more dragons. So he goes and defeats that, saves the day, and restores peace throughout the land. So he gets to spend the rest of his days being nice and choosy in which of his many harem of girls he'll take as his bride.
This game takes place about 20 years prior to the events of Binding Blade, and follows three lords. Hector, the only reason people take axes seriously in these games, Elliewood, the one everyone forgets about despite being the face of the game, and Lynn, the, uh, popular one. Oh, and this game also had a player insert character, a tactician named Insert Name Here. He doesn't talk and is barely referenced throughout the game. In any case, after a short prelude where Lynn leaves her home of nomadic tribesmen to find out that she's actually a noble, our game actually begins with either Hector or Elliewood, depending on how much of a man you are, heading out after a group of bandits known as the Black Fang. They live in the nation of Burn and seem to be trying to incite a massive war. As the group travel and grow in number, they find that the Black Fang is actually being controlled by a cartoonishly evil man named Nurgle. He is using these weird homunculus puppet things to control the Black Fang into doing his evil bidding, resurrecting the ancient dragons, because of course that's his goal. So the three lords defeat the members of the Black Fang, as well as Nurgle's puppets, prevent war from actually breaking out, save the life of Zephyl and Guinevere, who live the most Dickensian lifestyle I've ever seen. Anyways, after that, you stop Nurgle before he can summon a bunch of dragons, only for him to summon one, but you defeat it anyway and bring peace once again to the land. Or did you? <laughs> this game follows the life and times of the totally platonic brother and sister of Frame and Erica. They are the Prince and Prince of Renea, so a small peace-loving nation that against all odds goes the entire game without getting invaded. Now of course a large militaristic nation of Grotto invades, kills their father, and attempts to do the same to them. The twins are separated, Erica flees and attempts to gather allies to help in their cause while Lefraim tries to stem the forces of Grotto, and eventually they reunite and try to set off to talk with their old friend the Prince of Grotto, Leon. You see, Leon was a sweet and effeminate boy who could hardly hurt a fly. There's no way he could be the one behind all this, is there? Of course, it turns out that dark magic's behind everything and Grotto's trying to resurrect an ancient demon. So the twins unite the rest of the land against Grotto, defeat their buddy Leon, only to find out that defeating him was the final sacrifice necessary for resurrecting the ancient demon. So they defeat the demon, seal it away, and once again bring peace to the land. This game kicks off with our boy Ike living a simple life as a mercenary in a group that his father Grail runs, known as the Grail Mercenaries. Unfortunately for him, this is a Fire Emblem game, so of course the small, peace-loving nation that they're living in, known as Crimea, is invaded by the larger, evil nation of Dayan. His father is killed in a battle with a mysterious man in black armor, and leadership of the Grail Mercenaries is handed over to his right hand, the very competent and intelligent Titania. Oh no, wait, that, that would have been the logical course of action. Of course, actually, it's handed over to Ike directly, who doesn't know what a Laguz is. Anyways, Ike and the rest of the Grail mercenaries take it upon themselves to protect who should be the main character of this game, Alencia, the Princess of Crimea. They're forced to flee Crimea as Dan seeks to remove its sole remaining heir and travels through the beast, dragon, and bird Lagoos countries before eventually finding refuge in the massive nation of Benyon. There, they get aid from the Empress, get an army capable of marching on Dan, and begin the invasion to usurp its ruler, a man named Ashnard. Along the way, Ike is forced to face the mysterious man in black armor in honorable one-on-one -on -one combat. After that, you invade the capital of Dan, defeat the king, and return peace to the land. This game takes place two years after the events of Path of Radiance. This time it's about a girl named Micaiah, who starts a small ragtag rebellion within Dayan to overthrow the oppressive regime of Benyon who've been occupying it for the past two years since they, you know, lost the war. Meanwhile, there's a rebellion going on in Crimea, and now Queen Alencia is forced to deal with a small civil war. Also meanwhile, the Laguz nations, with the help of the Grail mercenaries, have all gotten pissed off at Benyon because of, uh, something something racism. I don't know, I, I always tune it out whenever the filthy subhumans talk. Anyways, you play through all of them simultaneously, and eventually all the forces end up colliding. The Laguz and Benyon constantly vie for power, Crimea stops its civil war and tries to be neutral, and Dayon sides with Benyon because something, something, plot convenient magic contract. Just as it's all coming to a head, uh, everyone turns to stone. 
Apparently all this fighting caused an ancient god of order to awaken, and she turned everyone to stone because they were causing too much noise. The forces of Dea and Crimea and some of Benyon, as well as all but the Dragon Lagoos, all joined together to put a stop to the goddess. And with the help of a god of chaos, you manage to break through her defenses and put a stop to her for good. The world is restored, Micaiah goes off to live with her boy toy, Lencia returns to rule in peace, and Ike decides to wander off and become a gay icon. This game follows the story of Krom, the what if we made Ike into a prince of main characters. Only now we also get to simultaneously follow the story of our player insert character, Robin, who, unlike insert name here, actually has a personality. Not a great one, but I mean, he slash she does at least have one. Anyways, Krom finds Robin snoozing in a field and the two become fast friends. Together, they and a ragtag group of soldiers fight to repel a large number of bandits that have been entering their kingdom of Elise from the neighboring kingdom, Plegia. They try to negotiate with the Plegians about these bandits, only to find that their king is unbelievably evil! Oh, you thought Nurgle was a Saturday morning cartoon villain? Well, Gangrel is happy to oblige! <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they kill Krom's sister, and after a bit of moping, you put a stop to Gangrel's villain's plans, and defeat them before they can cause any true harm to Elise. And as such, peace returns to the land, Krom settles down, gets married, has a daughter, and the world is a happier place. A new force is threatening to invade from the west, this time a much larger nation known as Valm. They've been wiping out small countries one after the other, and Elise looks to be their next target. So you set off to put a stop to their treachery when you get help from an unexpected ally. It's Krom's daughter, from the future! Apparently, Lucina came back in time to save Krom and stop her future from happening, where the world's ruled by an evil black dragon, because of course it is. Anyways, now Krom and Robin have to both stop Valm from taking over the world, as well as perform an ancient ritual that'll stop the evil dragon from being resurrected and taking over the world. So they stop Valm, but then it turns out that Robin is actually created to be the vessel of the evil dragon, and that he slash she is the one who's going to kill Krom in the future, but the power of friendship prevents that from happening, so Robin from the future shows up and summons an evil dragon. But because Robin was going to be the vessel, then if both past and future Robin die, then the evil dragon will die as well, so they kill them both. But of course, good Robin comes back because of something, something friendship. Fates begins with our self-insert character Corin, finally a main lord and not just a tactician along for the ride. He slash she was raised in the nation of Nor, where it's eternally night, stone monstrosities wander the land, and the national pastime is clubbing baby seals. But through a couple circumstances involving his slash her exceedingly evil father, Corrin ends up getting taken to the enemy nation of Ashido. It's a nation of eternal sunshine, crops actually grow naturally, and the national pastime is putting daisies in your loved one's hair. While there, Corrin discovers that while they may have been raised in Nor, they were actually born in Hishido. Oh, and they can transform into a Dialga from Pokemon. <laughs> Eventually, though, your Norian siblings manage to track you down and have a bit of a head-to-head -head with your Hashidan siblings. So Corrin is forced to choose which side they should follow. So of course you join the good guys where you execute a long campaign to put a stop to the tyrannical emperor of the Norian Empire. You fight your way through your Norian friends and family, but ultimately prevail. Stop the threat of Nor and bring peace to the land. So of course you join the much cooler guys, where you fight a long campaign to stop Ashido while simultaneously trying to make Nor a better place from the inside. So you have to try and defeat Ashido with as little collateral damage as possible, while at the same time making it look like you're 100% loyal to Nor. Ultimately, you fight your way through Ashido, help to quell the darkness with a Nor, and defeat the evil Taco King, and once again bring peace to the land. So of course you have to join neither side and instead help out with the mysterious Princess Azura. She helps you to figure out that neither Nor or Hashido are evil. No, it's all the work of evil invisible men living at the bottom of a bottomless canyon inside a great big evil invisible empire. 
So, you head to the bottom of the canyon, defeat the invisible man and the evil dragon demon that's leading them. I know that you were actually born in this kingdom, so no more guilt about porking your siblings, and once again bring peace to the land. 